welcome to another episode of the SD4L show. I'm Justin Thin. I'm here with my co-host, Matt Sheehan. Matt, how are you doing on this Wednesday eve? Whoa, are those fireworks? I guess those are. What a banger way to start wow. the show here. Do I you got know? the magic hands today. I don't know what don't I just that did. Happened? No, I, I got no well, idea how that, that happened. Was perfect. What a treat for the video listeners. Um, what a shame for the audio listeners. Yeah, it's um, a bummer. But yeah, Matt's screen kind of went dim, and then there were fireworks all around him. And um, oh, they're doing it again. It's whenever I do all double right, thumbs I, up. Okay, we got this. All right, okay, I've got to stop okay. doing that because wait, this... do it, do it one more time. Do it one more time. Wow. Oh my gosh, that does work. Wow, Is it, does it work when I do it? No. Okay. All right. Oh, shoot. Anyway. That's a bummer. All right. <laughs> Roaring start to the show here. Uh, podcast yes. listeners are, have got to be thrilled with how this is going right now. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, Matt, on this fine late Wednesday night, how are you doing? Confused after the fireworks, but yes. oddly fired off. Look, I know that there have been some lumps that we've taken here in East Lansing, but there's also been some positives. So, Justin, this is what I'm yes. going to do. Instead of waiting till minute number 58 to ask people to do this, like yes. I always do. Rate, review, subscribe, comment below what your favorite part of the week has been. Is it Frankie Fiddler? Is it Leo Hannon committing? Is it Karon Lynch Adams transferring over to Michigan State? Or go off the wall, baby. You, you can come up with your own thing, but comment below. Helps the algorithm. Helps us be happy. Yes. So that's uh, yes. what we got there. But no, I'm doing it. Justin, how are you doing over there, man? We doing okay? Matt, it is draft week. The draft yeah. is going to be tomorrow or today for those listening on Thursday, which yep. will be everybody since this gets uploaded <laughs> at like 7 a.m. on Thursday. Um, I got my Eagle shirt on. Looking forward to which offensive lineman they draft, despite not having a single need for an offensive yeah. lineman as a starter in this upcoming year. But sure. that's how the Eagles do it. The backup defense lineman or backup offensive tackle is what they will take every single year. I have made money on them the last two years to take a defensive <laughs> tackle with their, or defense lineman with their first two picks. This year, I put $58 and two cents wow. on them to take an offensive lineman with their first pick, and that will be hitting. Um, and okay. if not, we'll find a way to scrub this, like Nike scrubbed that one video yep. of LeBron getting dunked out of camp. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the long answer to your question, Matt, is it is hard for me to be unhappy in draft week. And uh, after we're done recording this, and uh, after I possibly turn in my assignment that's due for my MBA program at, at midnight, I will be excitedly turning on Draft Day, the movie that nice. many people hate, oh. including my colleague Stephen Brooks at 24-7. But, yeah. you know, it's art. It is It is art. So Pure cinema. Well. Cinema yeah. the way they intended to be yes. shot. Yes. Yes. Um, well, there you go, man. Uh, I fancied a wager on my Detroit Lions to take mm. defensive line, so it's either edge mm. or tackle first yes. round. So, yeah, uh, we're we're both going to be rich beyond our wildest dreams. Yeah, at about yeah. roughly eleven thirty ish p.m. tonight. Yes, that Chop so. Robinson, welcome to Detroit. I'm only going to do that once here, Chop Robinson. <laughs> yeah. That's... Um. Okay, Matt. So okay. let us dive into the new additions that Michigan State has made over the next, or sorry, the last few days. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about the portal guys, but first we might as well start with Leo Hannon, the QB that Michigan State has wanted all along since the new staff got here. They were recruiting him back when they were at Oregon State. When they arrived at Michigan State, he was their first 2025 quarterback offer. Uh, might even have been their first 2025 offer in general, but um, definitely their first quarterback offer in the 2025 class. He um, is from Anaheim, played at Servite High School. Um, unless it's Servite, but I'm guessing. Oh, I've been saying Servite. I think a lot of okay, them. Good. Are All right. Good. Good. Servite. Uh, Here we go. <laughs> Servite. Um, but yeah, so uh, Leo Hannon was the guy they wanted all along. I know Ryan Montgomery uh, was somebody that Michigan State's previous yeah. staff had got on a ton of visits and um surprisingly ended up at georgia um but definitely good luck to him if he can stick it out there but mm -hmm. yeah like the michigan state staff the moment they walked in the door they knew they wanted leo hannon more than even if they could have gotten ryan montgomery and uh we'll see we'll see how that goes but i, I love the kids tape um i guess i'll dive into a little more of what i saw but before i continue this monologue i will let you speak what did sure. you think of with the leo hannon uh edition What's not to like about him? I mean, just the high school he plays at, the league that he plays in, the Trinity League over in Southern California, which is arguably the best league in the nation. Like there are there are some teams out there, JT. Like that that might as well be a group of five conference out there. They they play ball. 
So he's playing against the best of the best in the country. Right. And, of course, you're going to talk about everything that's with his highlight tape. You know, he's got the big arm. He's got this, this, and that. What I took away, and hopefully I'm not going to steal too much of your thunder here, is there's two yeah. things that I loved about him, and they're both mature for a high school quarterback. The first one is his legs. And no, I'm not just talking about scrambling. No, I'm not just talking about bailing out of the pocket and then jolting upfield for a 10-yard gain. He knows where that line of scrimmage is. He knows that, okay, instead of bolting for an eight-yard scramble, for example, I'm going to prolong this play for about two or three seconds, tap dance on this line of scrimmage, let the receiver cross the field completely and out of coverage, and then he'll find it for 20 yards. Like, he orchestrates the game with his feet beautifully, and he orchestrates the game with his eyes beautifully. We've seen it all the time in NFL. We see it time and time again in college. But high school, you don't really see it at that level, even with some of the best highly ranked quarterbacks of, okay, here I am. I'm looking left. I'm looking left. Ha, gotcha, suckers. You all are idiots because I'm going right this whole time. Turns around, and there's a guy right up the seam for a big game. You see that time and time again with his highlight film. So those are the two things that I like, two things that are mature for a high school quarterback that still has yet to play a senior season, of course. So yeah, definitely. that's what I like about Leo Hannon. Yeah, and, and, and all of that speaks to not just the coaching that he gets, but also yeah. the actual scheme and the playbook that they run over there. Totally. It's a multi-read scheme. Um, and moreover, they it's RPO based. Um, there's a lot of decision making that he has to go ahead and conduct. Um, but yeah, so with that comes great mobility. And like you said, he he doesn't just run to scramble. He, he kind of has mobility in order to set up the play in order to let yeah. the routes develop, extend the play. But yeah, he does have legitimate downfield scrambling abilities too. Um, people can go uh, to, to my profile and just scroll a little bit. I posted like yeah. two minutes and 32 seconds of his highlights. Um, there's a couple really impressive long scrambles in there. Um, also just there, there's one play where he jukes out like four guys in like a 12 yard span. So short, um, short range, sort of elusive elusiveness as well. Throwing the ball wise, he has every throw in his arsenal. Um, a lot of guys that are very talented and have a very strong arm. They have the, the, I guess the downside or the weakness of only throwing one speed. Yeah. Leo Hannon could not be further from that given a uh, weakness, um, touch throws, um, back shoulder fades, absolute missiles into tight windows, uh, deep cannons, uh, of like 60 yards downfield out routes to the opposite halves that have a zip. So, um, and, and a lot of off platform throws after he extended the plays, like you're saying, so has all the tools. Um, he's an 89 on 24 seven sports. And I would not be surprised if he picks up his fourth star by the uh, end of his senior year. So, Michigan State got the quarterback that they offered in the very beginning of the staff's arrival, and that is how they kicked off the 2025 class. So that's ideal. You get your headliner quarterback, and then uh, you fill it out from the rest and should be getting another commit here in the in the next few days. So um, should be uh, should be a good week in that regard. Matt, which of the two portal guys would you like to discuss that have committed? Let's start with the most recent one, K-Ron Lynch Adams, RB2? Or maybe RB one and a half. Yeah. Like that that's right. the thing. Is like, wow, this running back room kind of is like a two-headed monster with two guys that are built the same almost with Nate Carter, K Ron Lynch mm -hmm. Adams. Both guys, 5'10, Lynch Adams, 205 pounds, Nate Carter, 200 pounds. That's what the rosters say. But yeah, it's not much of a lightning and thunder. It's more of a hey, here's some thunder, and then here's some more thunder for you. Like it, it fascinating that they got two guys of the same mold almost. Yeah. I, I think that comes from the fact that Carter already is the mold that they like. Um yeah. if you look at kind of how Damian Martinez played, yeah. I think um one way to describe him, he's the better version of Nathan Carter. Um doesn't dance around too much, but has wiggle laterally, more of a one cut guy than just a complete agile LaShawn McCoy cut on a dime over and over again type of back. And uh, but has physicality. And um, we remember from when Nate Carter committed to Michigan State that he led the nation in yards after contact through those first four weeks at UConn before he was injured. Um, he wasn't very healthy last year, from my understanding. Um, so he didn't break as many tackles as I would have liked to have seen him break. Also didn't force as many missed tackles uh, as well, but I, I think he'll he'll do more of that this year. Um, I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, but you did a very good job of painting the comparison between the two is is overlapping a lot because um, when we first kind of saw that the offer went out and the visit was um, being scheduled, 
that's kind of the first takeaway I had after watching his tape for just like 60, 70 seconds before I went and watched further. I said he has the same strengths and weaknesses as Nathan Carter. Seems like they're just going to try to double up and have two guys they believe in because uh, I don't think they really believed in um, Jalen Berger. And we saw that he has sure. hit the transfer portal as a result of that because they wanted to bring in someone like Carolyn Lynch Adams. And so, yeah, you have a guy that has ability to make guys miss, has – um, and Karen Lynch Adams' tape, I didn't see him run through as many arm tackles, but I did see a couple of plays of him just putting his helmet down and running into yeah. linebackers and not caring about his, his safety. Um, but his was much more springy, um, I would say, than Carter's, where Carter's was kind of just breaking through arm tackles. Um, but yeah, both guys are one cutbacks, and I'm very excited to see what he does here. Um, after the jerk Broussard uh, miss that I kind of had in terms of the optimism I had there, Probably the biggest miss I've had uh, in like the four years or so I've covered Michigan State was kind of how excited I was for him. And sure. I mean, he was Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year, so I wasn't like selling hope. I would say I was. I it wasn't there. crazy, right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, like I would say, I, I'm I'm kind of just waiting and seeing. But he's a hundred yard rusher. He was um, Phil right. Steele had him as the All Independent First Team running back. So that means that Phil Steele was saying he was better than Audric Estime. I don't know necessarily if I agree with that or not, but that just tells you which level of tier of, I guess, of a pickup he is. So very excited there. Do you, do you have anything you want to add there? Not just six year player. You're going to get a lot of maturity, obviously, yeah. right? Started his career at Rutgers, went over to Massachusetts. And with that experience, that maturity and what you see on the tape is he does have a patience about his game. And I know that the very easy comparison is just Le'Veon Bell because, well, that's what he made famous in the NFL is just patience behind the line. And he's a Spartan, so why not talk about him? I'm not saying he is Le'Veon Bell. Like, he, he's not going to have that production that Le'Veon Bell had in 2012. Let's not get it twisted here. But he does take a beat, and he does let the play unfold, and he does have good eyes behind the line of scrimmage here. Now, let's hope this year – and he actually has time to take a peek for a second because I think that was also an issue with Nate Carter, too. He's not getting a lot of yards after contact. Is He was getting contacted basically when he was being handed the ball in the backfield. So if we could just get some help for our running backs this year, that'd be cool. Uh, just going out on a limb there and saying that. Yeah, That's for sure. my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, but hey, good pickup for Michigan State. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see what the splits are going to be between Carter, Lynch, Adams. I mean, that's a, that's a two-headed monster right there. So really, really nice start. To piling on some names here in the spring of portal window, or I guess that wasn't the start. That was only the second name. You want to bring up the first name? Yes, Anthony Jones committed to Michigan State um, on Sunday night, I believe. Uh, he yeah. was uh, – yeah, I think that sounds about right. Sure. He yeah. was the edge rusher from Indiana who started his career at Oregon. Um, he talked to me uh, before the visit, and then um, I, I had him on the phone a few hours before he committed. And uh, both times the echo that Demetrius Martin, the new Michigan State DBs coach, he is like an uncle to him. Um, and uh, then obviously the connection to, to Indiana where Chad Wilt was the um, Rush Ends coach there. And that's what he's coaching at Michigan State here. So you are, you are seeing the overlap there of two guys that wanted him at their previous schools, wanting him again here. And um, he's a redshirt freshman, not a lot of tape on him. But to me, that means yeah. more than anything else is those two guys that know him, uh, spend at least a year around him that want him here again. He did have five tackles against Penn State. That was kind of his, his one breakout performance last year. Uh, but more so, he has familiarity in exactly what Chad Wilt wants in that role. Um, and that that I mean, we can talk more about this later when we talk about by Joe. But I think sure. the biggest thing is if there's a defensive end that fits the mold of a rush end, they need a certain level of understanding of the game of football and uh, a familiarity with what's asked for them in that role. And uh, he has that more so than anything else. So I think uh, that alone is going to have him kind of be a plug and play rotational piece, probably behind um, Chris Bogle, maybe right behind Jalen Thompson. One of those two guys might slide over to the other side, but he's firmly in that playing group. And uh, that's not something that we could say about any of the guys that have departed from that, from that room. So um, I guess anything else you want to add there, Matt, with Anthony Jones? Not with Anthony Jones, but I do want to keep it on the defensive line right now mm -hmm. as it pertains to the portal because we're going to yeah. get to the departures. Of course, we're, we're not going to just ignore that. But before that, let's talk about a guy that could be replacing some of the bigger names on there. This is a guy that you have been very high on. This this even came out. You, I, I heard you utter his <laughs> name out loud. Before it was even reported that he was going to visit Michigan State. Yes. So, Mr. Ball Knower JT over there, 
introduce the man. Just just go for it. Yeah, Stephen F. Austin, uh, defensive tackle, Brandon Lane. Um, I didn't discover him or anything. I wasn't watching. Uh, yes, Stephen you Foss did. Tate. Come on. <laughs> I read yes, uh, Chris, Chris Hummer and Matt Zenitz of Red 24-7. Uh, they had him as one of their most underrated players in the entire portal. Had a, had 44 tackles from the interior of the defensive line. Not easy to do. Um, and honestly, I saw like some of the some of the programs that were offer, a, after him. I know Washington's one of the ones that have already hosted him. Um, it just seemed like a like an obvious fit. Like I'm not predicting him to come in here and be all Big Ten first team, but like immediately when I read his name, I filed it away as all right. If you're looking for a savvy signing from a guy that had high level of play at, at the FCS level and that other credible programs like Jed Fish's program at Arizona was one of those developmental programs that like Michigan State um, used to be in what Jonathan Smith was at Oregon State. And I'm thinking like overlap and who has interest in him, the production he had at that level, credible guys like Chris Hummer and Matt Sennett's kind of uh, like building him up. I'm thinking that's the kind of guy you can go and get. And also Texas A&M and Texas and those guys aren't after him. To me, it was like, this is the most logical step for you to maybe replace Simeon Barrow. And then when Derek Harmon entered the portal, right after that is when we were talking and I said Brandon Lane in all caps uh, yeah. when we were talking about how like there doesn't have to be a huge delta if they go ahead and execute the portal strategy properly. So um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, he's going to be visiting Michigan State here shortly. Um, just clicking on the pinned tab that we have on the Spartan Tailgate message board. He is supposed to be here on April 24th today. Um, he's going to be here for a couple days. Tomorrow is Javarius Johnson, the uh, wide receiver from Auburn. He is pulling up to Michigan State. Um, also arrived today, Eddie Kelly, the strong side defensive end, so not the rush end position, um, Georgia Tech's Eddie Kelly. Um, so he's going to be the guy that they're going to probably target for that side if they need somebody there. But I guess it just depends on if they feel they're going to move one of their potential rush end guys in Thompson and Bogle down to that spot. So, yeah, I, I guess right now the way I talk about the defensive end room and how I'll talk about it when we talk about the departures is I just group them all together. Um, and they'll probably see, like, who can't execute some of the responsibilities of the rush end. And most likely they'll have the weight necessary to also play strong side defensive end. So I kind of just group it all together when talking about names for now. But – yeah, some, uh, some good candidates there visiting. Also, Tyler Gillison, the brother of Trenton yeah. Gillison, the former Michigan State tight end. He was a redshirt freshman um, rush end at Cincinnati. So maybe if they add him and you've added Anthony Jones at rush end, maybe move two of the guys uh, that are in the rush end room right now down to strong side defensive end, then you don't take Eddie Kelly. So they're giving, giving themselves a lot of optionality here for sure. I need help, JT. There was a story a few years ago. This was during NBA free agency. Rumor has it that Mark Cuban and the Mavericks locked a player in the house until he pledged. Was it? It was De the Clippers. DeAndre? It was. I was the Clippers to, to keep him from going to the Mavericks. I believe. I would again, and, uh, assuming that we're up to fire codes and yes. everything, and that we're not actually kidnapping a person. I would like the closest oh, okay. thing, though. Well, you know, we can figure out the details yeah. later. Just do that to Brandon Lane. Like, yes. just do, do, do not make him leave campus without him signing some dotted line that he's coming here next year. Like, look, every player that you named would be delightful if they become a Michigan State Spartan. Mm -hmm. Jamarius Johnson, that's a fun player. He would fit great for that slot receiver role. But, man, would Brandon Lane just really soften the blow that you've had with Simeon Barrow and Derek Harmon both leaving? Right. I mean, the, yeah. the drop-off would not be that steep. Yeah. And I know that sounds crazy because we we love Simeon Bear, we love Derek Harmon, they're good players here, but right, uh, I I am buying the hype with Brandon yeah. Lane. So I, I would yeah. say I would say the drop off from from Derek Harmon wouldn't be that big, um, like just straight up. Um, and then yeah, kind of like you're saying, Simeon Barrow, I I've been hyping him up all spring. He uh, he yeah. had a good spring. Um, didn't necessarily get complacent after the Ohio State and Oregon interest. So I, that was something I was worried about. Like, is he going to think he's arrived? And he had some weight issues back in high school. And gotcha. he uh, he was pretty much uh, clear of any of those obstacles. So disappointing to see him go. Um, I guess now we'll transition into talking about yep. the departures. But, I, yeah, Simeon Barrow, I, I don't know. I, I thought um, not just because he's out of the portal a million times, and that doesn't really factor into my evaluation of him, but – he seemed like somebody whose name carried more weight than his actual presence on the field. 
Um, and obviously, you'd rather have him than lose him. But right. to me, I, he's in a different conversation than um, Simeon Barrow, who I think is like a, a clear cut loss. Whereas Simeon Barrow, it's like, oh, the roster is better if he's here than if he's not here. But I'm just not like reacting or flinching much of his departure. Um, but like, yeah, so those to me are really the only two guys that they've lost um, that I would consider to be meaningful losses in terms of the 2024 season's outcome. There's guys with potential that they might have lost. Like even then, it's really very few, like maybe just by Job, and we'll talk about him l- later. But sure. I guess just wrapping up the Harmon tidbit here, um, like, yeah, Florida State had been coming after him pretty much all of March. Um, and then, um, or sorry, that was that was Simeon Barrow. But Simeon Barrow, Florida State had been coming after him all of March. They went ahead and uh, Michigan State took care of that, squashed that. And now it sounds like um, Miami and I think LSU, um, among some others, were the ones that once again circled back right after Michigan State had taken care of that. Because last episode I was over here saying that mm-hmm. um, a lot of the rumors out there were from the old rumor that the Florida State tampering was going on with. That was indeed squashed. Now he may visit Florida State now that he's in the portal anyway, yeah, right. but that was a separate event, a separate occurrence. They took care of that. And then he entered now from new tampering, I guess, uh, right when this portal window started. So that's Barrow. That's covered. Now, Derek Harmon, there was not really any clue or any sign that he was going to hit the portal. Michigan State, right after the Oregon and Ohio State official visits this past uh, winter, they gave him a huge uh, mega NIL deal. Um, I don't know if uh, JT Tuomaloa from Ohio State ended up edging him out like shortly after that window because he never entered. So we don't know at necessarily what point they might have bumped him up to meet market value. But at the time that Derek Harmon had got his deal from the Oregon and Ohio State interest, he was, I was told from somebody that would know more nationally than, than me, that he was the highest paid defense tackle in the Big Ten at the time. Um, so again, like, I don't know if that was the case four months later, but either way, like Michigan State really did all they could here. And um, talking behind the scenes to a, a different person that would kind of know, they're saying that he thinks uh, he could be commanding up to $800,000. And um, let me just put it this way. That would be a pretty big raise from what was already a number that made him the big, highest paid defensive tackle in the right. Big Ten four months ago. So I don't know what you're really supposed to do for Michigan State there. Um, but like, again, like he's a big loss. Not really any way to spin that. But like, I really don't know what like you could have named me the head coach. I don't think I would have had any answer here. Like there's not even any sort of way where we um, can play Monday morning quarterback or hindsight 2020. Like that's just what it is. I mean, look, I, you, you were there with me when I went through all the emotions. Cause like, <laughs> I, I, I did not analyst like a grown adult. No, like I was pretty upset, but when the dust settles and you look around, like, can you really blame Michigan state? Look, they just like you said, JT, they already made him one of the most highest yeah. paid you know, defensive line, right. if not right. the right. So eventually when the other schools come in and they're offering, as you said, $800,000, which by the way, just to, you know, compare that to NFL money line third round pick last year, Broderick Martin, that's just about what a signing bonus was last year. And that is something that I really need fans to know is the kind of money we are talking about right now. Right. Cause I think that there's a good faction of the fan base out there that thinks, Oh, that, Oh, Oh, MSU gave him $20,000 and someone came in and offered him 25. <laughs> No, 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 no. We're talking six figure life changing money here. Like there is a reason that this has happened. So you can't blame Michigan state for eventually saying like, screw it. Like, look, I know that we like him, but eventually he's being paid. Like he's already a day two draft pick. When this guy, honest, look, I I love Derek Carmen, Sammy Barrow, great players. Yeah. They've maxed out as big 10 honorable mentions. And I know those are just voted awards, but still like they, that kind of slots to where they played the last few years. Mm -hmm. Sure. They could be a little better this year, but what you know so far is honorable mention players. So are you really going to fault Michigan state and the NIL coffers for not going up $300,000 on a player that will hold on? Well, what are we even paying for in the first place? Let's just get some guys to replace them at a fraction of the cost. That isn't that steep of a drop off. And then you go to the players. You go to Simeon Barrow, Derek Harmon. Oh, what happened to loyalty? Oh, shouldn't they be happy Michigan State took care of them? Again, look at the money being discussed right now. Right. If you and your house 
or your job that you just absolutely love, let's say, and you're sitting there, hey, they took care of you. Company number two comes in and says, hey, how about a 50% raise on top of right. all that? You're going to pick up the phone if you have respect for yourself. I'm so, right. Look, it brings me no joy to say that as a Michigan State fan, right. but MSU's NIL is like tier two right now, I think I'd say. It's those seven to 10 schools that are like tier one right now right. that are just jonesing to offload money because money ain't an issue with them. So it's I'm just looking at who to blame. Do I blame MSU? Nope. Can't, can, do you blame the players? Honestly, no, because you got to understand situations that empath, emphasize with people. Yeah. So here I am just sitting pouty that like, well, let's chalk it up to the game being the game and the crappy system that it is. So that was a lot of ranting, a lot of raving, but that was a long way of saying that it, it, it just sucks. Right. How about that? It just sucks yeah. because that's the way college sports is right now with no guardrails whatsoever. It's free yeah. agency 24 seven. So it just right. sucks. Matt, now that we have put a bow on the Derek Harmon discussion, which everything you said there, um, very spot on. Don't even have to add anything or respond to anything there. Definitely yeah. agree with all of that. A little unhinged, but yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, just uh, passionate because I'm just angry. I just don't know who to be angry at, JT. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. where I'm at. Yes. Um, we will let Thomas O handle. Um, <laughs> the the portal on he our has and... never been more correct in his entire never, life than never. he is. And, and he's been right a lot of times. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and honestly, that's always been obvious and clear. The frustration has just been, well, yes, Tom, you are absolutely correct. Now right. let's, let's use it for a couple guys. Right. Um, but yeah, so, but yeah, that, that's a different discussion. And we'll talk about Frankie Fiddler and how MSU was very savvy and everything that they did there. Um, Okay, Matt, I want to run through every single departure that Michigan State had in the transfer yeah. portal in this window out of the scholarship players, not counting, obviously, Derek Harmon and Simeon Barra, who we just talked about at length and how they're legitimate losses. Um, Simeon Barrow, not as much as Derek Harmon, but still, like, two guys you want on your roster yeah. for sure. I will run through each of them and just briefly say, like, where they were on the depth chart, roughly. Um, some of them I might not even need to do that. Like, fans will just know, like, they yeah. barely saw the field. They've been here a couple of years. I'll I'll just go in order of how I have them listed in this uh, document that I I, I uh, tweeted out today uh, from the um, the Spartan Tailgate site. Just my Google Sheet link that is in there to kind of look at who's left and who's staying. Jalen Barberin transferred out of Michigan State, running back from the 2023 class. Um, he was not going to play this year. Uh, Michigan State obviously added uh, a portal running back this year. We talked about it at the beginning of the show. Nathan Carter was there. Brandon Tulis uh, was ahead of him as well. Um, whoever they probably signed in this upcoming year's class would probably have came in and slid right ahead of him. Not a too deep loss. Ma Nauteote, we kind of saw like the writing on yeah. the wall there the last few years. Braden Miller, um, so he was playing guard. Uh, Michigan State's guards um, coming into fall camp will be left guard, probably starting Luke Newman. Left guard, probably the backup, Gavin Brocious. Right guard, the starter, probably Gino Vandermark. Probably the next guy off the bench, um, Chris Phillips. Like the, the left guard and right guard spots, the two deep set. He was not in it. Eddie Pleasant, not in the two deep at quarterback. Davion Prim, not in the two deep at running back. Yeah. Um, Sean Brown, not in the two deep um, at cornerback or safety. I'm not even sure which of the two he played. He probably could have been seen as the fourth safety if you don't count Dylan Tatum there, which he is now okay. a safety. But, like, I think they were going to try to recruit over him this year and probably try to get a safety, which to that point um, they're hosting a Houston um, safety that I just confirmed with him that he's taking an OV this weekend. Nice. Uh, or, sorry, next week. Um Continuing on, Marquis Lowry. Now, he's a guy that I was high on. He's a guy that was in the two deep when he was healthy, but he hasn't been healthy in two years. Yeah. Antonio Gates, uh, ahead of him was Jerron Glover, Montori Foster, um, whichever portal wide receiver they land, um, Nick Marsh, um, Isaiah Johnson, and uh, Alante Brown, most likely. Uh, I would say he was ahead of him for sure, but I don't know if he would have stayed ahead of him all year. But six guys would have been ahead of Antonio Gates at press time um, right after the, the portal window would have. Closed. He was even ahead of him at point right now. Um, then 
and you're looking at Andrew DePape. Andrew was not in the, I would even say the three deep at defensive end, uh, kind of running through that real quickly. You would have um, by Job, uh, or sorry, by Job, uh, just departed. I'll talk about him in a second, but you would have um, Jalen Thompson and Chris Bogle. One of those guys is probably going to be the starter at stand up edge. We'll see if the other one gets moved to strong side or is just the backup at edge. Um, and then next up, you would probably have uh, Quindarius Dunnigan and Avery Dunn. Behind that, James Schott would probably be the fifth yeah. name, not counting Anthony Jones. I think he'd slide in into that fifth spot. And then uh, you're probably looking at James Schott sixth. And then you're probably looking at after that by Job. Maybe, I guess, if Ken Talley is still considered a defensive end, he might be ahead of him even. And then DePape was even behind that. So, like, I don't think DePape probably was going to see the field in the next two years, let alone this year. And then, um, yeah, by Job, I just kind of mentioned him there in that in that fringe fourth level of the of the whole thing, and uh, that's it out of the all the guys other than uh, Simeon Barrow and Derek Harmon. Michigan State lost fourteen guys so far, and two of them were real losses. That kind of brings me to the point of I haven't like really scrolled the timeline recently, but like based on kind of what I've briefly seen, and even some of the threads I've seen started about. How do you uh, how do you come back from this? So, like, how do you revamp your strategy, or what should Smith do going forward now that this has happened in terms of right, like how he should right. approach the roster building and the classes? I'm really not seeing that whatsoever. Like, maybe I'm that far removed from reality, but I just went through and named all 14 guys that have left so far and where they stood on the depth chart, and two of them were in the two deep. So I'm not seeing like where the reaction is coming from. Now, Derek Harmon is a is a big loss, but he is one guy. So I don't see that to mean um, that any operation or the way of doing things or roster building development should be gleaned from it. So yeah. like they haven't really lost anyone. Oh, I guess Jalen Berger, I, I don't have him on those lists, but Michigan State had to make room in order to get um, Karon Lynch at him. So this is exactly what, Anybody, I guess, would have wanted Michigan State to do this exact portal window other than Barrow and Harmon. Like, this has been an, almost an ideal, perfect uh, offseason in terms of the portal outside yeah. of Harmon and Barrow. So I'm not really understanding where all of this kind of reaction is coming from. Now, by Job, like, as I said, like, he wasn't in the too deep this year. But, like, I, I understand that you'd rather have him here for his redshirt junior year once he's maybe coached yeah. up to the point where, like, he understands what he's doing on the field. Right now, he definitely was not going to be anywhere close to being ready to handle the responsibilities of the rush end and the various dropbacks and all this and that. But like, I would rather have him on the roster two years from now, three years from now, than him leaving today. I get that. But nobody that they've lost out of these 15 guys now, other than two of them, probably would have made any impact this year. The by Job thing, yeah, obviously, just like you said, yeah, of, of course you'd rather have him than not. Was he going to make an impact this year? No, odds are probably not. But still, like that's the guy that mm-hmm. hopefully the guy who came here as a raw athlete, an incredible right. raw athlete. That's how he got his top 100 yes. ranking. He could mold him into something good, but like that's just the day and age. These aren't the coaches he committed to. Yada yada. I don't think anyone's questioning why he's transferring or anything like that. Antonio Gates Jr. can almost kind of fall on the lines of that. He's a four-star guy. Showed some flashes, but look, even in years coming up, still could be behind Jerron Glover. Still yep. behind Nick Marsh, as we all saw on Saturday Spring Showcase. Like, that kid needs to see the field. So, I mean, he just can't crack the starting lineup for maybe even the rest of his college career with the way things are right now. So, you understand why those guys transfer. But yeah, going to the point about, like, the, the freakouts and the meltdowns, and again – Sure, the, the bear on the harmless thing is like worth not being happy over. Heck, mm. I, come inside of my brain. I wasn't too happy. <laughs> Heck, I'm still not even too thrilled about how things are going. But Justin, one, one thing I hate to do, and I genuinely do not like doing this, is ever acting like I'm like you know smarter than other people. Because quite frankly, I'm not. Like, look, <laughs> look at me. I'm not a smart person. I think the freak out though comes from the number that people are seeing. It's like, oh, 15 transfers since the spring portal started. And I ask people, when are we going to learn that this is just how it is? And I think a lot of viewers of this show, like people that watch the show are pretty in deep with recruiting and everything. I think a lot of people know that, okay, there's a story behind that number. But even during Mel Tucker, 
during that transfer portal, right. he's getting rid of almost 20 guys, 20 plus guys, because he had to. That's how you make a roster in college football. It's incredibly mean to say it's not nice, but you got to cut the fat off your team yeah. to bring in guys that can actually compete. So I think the freak out was so sure, Harmony Bear, of course. But I did see a lot of people being like, oh, man, 14 people have left Michigan State. What's going on? Right. Well, Jonathan Smith is just trying to get a competitive roster in place. For yeah. 12 of those 14 guys. Like, that's his story with 12 of those 14 guys, give or take a few. But, like, I, that's, like, when are people going to learn that's just what happens right. in the spring cycle? Especially, especially – with new coaching staffs that yeah. have a certain eye for certain guys. That they, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Again, I, I don't, I don't like coming off like that, but that God, Matt, learn. <laughs> like, Matt, I, Matt, I'll take it a step further. Not only, it. not only should fans have kind of expected um, that, or like should have known that this is going to happen. This is not even one of those things of, ah, okay. That's kind of what's supposed to happen. That's what happened. This should almost be a relief because when I was talking behind the scenes with like Corey and like a, a few other people looking at like the lack of room that they have to bring in yeah. new guys that can compete. And right. then the lack of rumors we were hearing of people that might leave. Cause we were only hearing like a few names. I was kind of thinking if these are the only guys that leave, they're in bad shape because there's going to be a lot of guys that are not going to contribute on this roster after the spring. And I don't know if Smith is going to have kind of, what it takes to tell people it's mutually best for both of us that you find somewhere else to go. Then when I kind of looking there and I'm sitting there looking at the number of, all right, it's up to 10 people that have left. It's up to 12 people that have left. That was actually kind of relief from the perspective of if you're trying to see what's best for Michigan state football, not only just a register of, all right, well, that's how it works, but almost like, uh, okay, they, they got it done. They, they did trim the roster down how you need it to be. So that's kind of what the reaction should have been, even for the people that saw the number. And if that was kind of what the reaction was stemming from, in my opinion. Yeah. And I guess like, what, like, what do you do with the by job thing? Right. Because obviously I like, I, right. I still want him here. Of course. Like I call me crazy. I like top 100 recruits. Right. But do you sacrifice this year just to make him somewhat happy? Because it's not like you were even going to thrust him into a starting role to yeah, even try to make so him happy. Away. So what do you do? Do you, do you tell Chris Bogle, a guy that is, you know, better than he is right now, as things stand again, right now, that could change in two years' time. But, right. like, do, do you just have by Joe to start carving into that role and those reps? And then, okay, well, what happens with Jalen Thompson? He could use reps, and he's already way more ready than by Joe is right now. Yeah. Like, I just don't know how, in a world, you could have kept by Joe happy. So maybe that's why, like, I'm yeah. not going to, like, lose any sleep on it. It's because, look, it, it is what it is at that point. There wasn't anything to do because this is going to be a pretty big year for Jonathan Smith. I don't think he's going to want to sacrifice play at certain positions just to maybe make a kid happy. Yeah. So I just and, don't know and, what the formula is there. Right. And it wasn't even one of those things where like, all right, it was a fringe battle and like Thompson right. would have edged right. him out by a little bit and maybe could have skewed the battle like 60, 40 and played favorites. Like, the gap was so huge in the understanding of yes. kind of how the defense is played and, and all that. Like, by Job was a very supreme athlete, like very twitchy, yeah. athletic, um, very agile. I think he kept that once he gained uh, some of the weight that he needed to gain. So I'm not going to discount anything from a physical standpoint, but like people that are at practice seeing like just simple drills in the, in the beginning sessions before the media gets kicked out, like it, there was just such a gap in, in kind of understanding of, of how things were kind of structured defensively. That like, even if Smith wanted to play favorites and and just even sacrifice um, a few successful um, scenarios and maybe putting him in on a third and four when you know he's not ready, that it wasn't even feasible. Like that's how big the gap was from an understanding aspect of like football IQ and things of that nature. Um, I didn't know that that was going to be the case. Like like by I know he he played in like um middle of nowhere oklahoma kind mm -hmm. of i think um and that was just there there was like a lot of talk about oh he's a very raw player but i thought it just meant he has to gain weight but like the the understanding side of it i i was not really familiar with and i know Corey, he's, he's kind of seen that up close uh going to practice so yeah it just wouldn't have been feasible to even force him to, to get any snaps so good 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 question there for sure
Yeah, so I, that puts a ball on it. Obviously, frustration around Harmon Barrow, but like, who can you really be upset in that situation? Yeah. The other three guys that were highly touted recruits, Gates, DePay, Job, you, you understand why they left. Mm-hmm. We're really close to making an impact this year. And even years down the road, there could be log jams. And then everyone else, I, it's nasty, but that that's college yeah. football these days. We, it, it's time to go for some of you guys. I'm sorry. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. So there it is. Frankie Fiddler, Matt, <laughs> is the last topic at hand. Michigan State got it done. Uh, he visited two Thursdays ago. Uh, coming into the visit, Michigan State was not in the lead. Um, I guess you could argue like where they were behind Wisconsin. I think Nebraska at that point was also ahead of Michigan State, but they were starting to fade. Um, Creighton was hovering around, but there was not a ton of confidence that they would have win it. But I think you could say they were ahead of Michigan State at the time of the visit, but sure. with very little potential to move higher than they were. And uh, Michigan State comes from behind and completely closed the door on anybody else being able to make any noise um, in the following weeks before he went public. Um, He did not give a complete confirmation, silent verbal that he was coming on the visit itself. But Michigan State was feeling pretty confident just like a day or two after it ended. Confidence did not waver at all in the remaining days until he did give that silent verbal. Gotcha. And then from from then until he went public, obviously that's where you see the Trilly Donovans and, and everybody else um, and people putting in picks um, that started to leak out at that point. But there was never any wavering of confidence really from the time he he took his visit until the time he announced two weeks later. Uh, just just a great job by Michigan State getting him wrapped up. Also, before we talk a little more about him, I want to point out before I forget the other guy they were kind of interested here in at the wing was. Um, uh, Javon Hadley, Javon Hadley yeah. from um, Colorado. He ended up going to Louisville. He basically uh, was getting kind of the similar numbers from Michigan State as he was from Iowa State. Chose Iowa State because of familiarity. His, his cousin was on that uh, yeah. roster. I believe an assistant coach from um, his JUCO or prep school, one of those two, um, is also on the Iowa State staff. Fair enough. Um, that was going to be kind of where he was going to go, and it all made sense. Then he kind of backs out of that Iowa State commitment before going public, but after giving it to them, wanted double the money that Iowa State had agreed to. And Iowa State said, yeah, um, yeah, for, you're the fourth option at Colorado. I, I like I liked the kid. Like, I wanted him at Michigan yeah, State. Sure. Not as much as Frankie Fiddler, but like, I think yeah. he projects positively where if you give him more volume. But the number that he was asking for, there was not a chance in the world that you that you could ask me, like, is anyone going to give him that? I would have said, no way. There's no way. Yeah. And Louisville immediately within a day was like, yep, we got you. Come <laughs> over here. So Michigan State was just very savvy and kind of not getting strung along too long there because they did, after the Iowa State thing kind of fell apart, they did get back involved okay. just to make sure there was an opportunity that they weren't missing there. And they're yeah. like, yeah this is not a recruitment we want to be part of. Let's just go ahead and let's make sure we get Frankie Fiddler no matter what. Went ahead and did that. So I love kind of how they just approached the whole portal cycle and dynamics there. Matt, I will let you talk about what you like from Frankie Fiddler's game, and then I'll see if there's anything I need to add. Oh, look, yeah, you're replacing a lot of scoring from last year, right, between Hogard, between Tyson Walker, and Malik Hall. Adding a guy that scored 20 points for his team last year yep. is going to help. Now, you're not going to plug 20 points in the MSU's roster next year just like that. There is a right. little gap between the Summit League and the Big Ten. But his game is nice, and it's one of those games that can translate into still being yep. a double-digit score in Big Ten play. What I love about him, well, is a lot of things. The first one, that he's a Spartan, of course. The second his shooting, because 85% free throw shooter, that is on his career. His three-point shooting has been up and down year to year, but last year, 36%. But the 85% stays constant, and you could draw a direct parallel to how good of a shooter you are to free throws more times than not. And he doesn't just make free throws, JT. He gets to yes. the line. I'm going to borrow a stat that I barked on on my show, uh, Locked on Spartans, the other day here. MSU has not had a player on its team attempt five or more free throws per game on average since the 2019 season where Cassius Winston averaged five free throw attempts per game on the dot. Frankie Fiddler last year, 7.7 attempts, wow. at 85% clip. That's wow. six free points you're getting when the game tips off essentially. And I also keep saying this too. I'm like 20% joking, 80% serious. We know that big 10 refs, 
like to blow themselves a whistle too. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's going to translate over pretty nicely here to Big Ten play too. But yes, the guy gets to the line. Michigan State has not cracked the top 150 in the nation at getting to the line. They have been starved yeah. as a team and as individual players to find their way in the free throw line. Frankie Filler can do that amongst yes. many other things like rebounding, three point shooting, yada yada. Yeah. Yes, you get the point. I love it. Fits great in the roster. Other people fit better in this roster now, like Jaden Aikens can play the two. Cohen Carr a little more of that four action. Garrick Norman, he gets to get behind a year or a year further behind a seasoned veteran. So uh, I'm a happy camper, JT. Yeah, I'm a happy camper. I agree. I agree. And obviously the um, bread is buttered on the offensive end for Frankie. Uh, scores at all three levels. As you said, very good at drawing yeah. free throws. Physical guy, uses his frame. Uh, good shooter from three. A uh, good shooter from the elbow. But defensively, it's there's 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 enough there. He he's not going to be probably all Big Ten defense. Uh, right. He's not going to be on, on that team. But he knows what to do from a cutting off angles and positioning standpoint. He has defensive IQ. He um, has hustle. I, I tweeted out a, a series of clips uh, a, a week or so ago. Uh, just the way that he cuts off driving lanes and takes the charges and recovers after maybe too aggressive of a first step. Like there's, there's enough there that he can play defense in this league. So very great pickup by Michigan state there up to 12 scholarships. Now um, yep. I'm not ready to say that the roster is set. Okay. I know there's a lot of language out there that the roster is likely set. Uh, maybe, maybe, um, but we'll see. We'll see. I, I haven't heard anything specific that it's not set, but I also um, I know that they're not just sitting around. So we'll see. Well, well, maybe I can talk more about it in the coming weeks. But yeah. we'll just we'll see what happens. We'll see what specifics are to report on. Until then, I'm not going to get anyone's hopes up or um, act like the portal's over. So just okay. we're gonna have to we're gonna have to sit and wait, and we'll get more clarity. I would think. One more question on Fiddler. And this is a very serious question, yes. JT. He had an interview, Jack Abling's radio show. Mm. A, a fantastic. A, a Jack Abling's just simply the yes. best out there. I very mean, good that, that guy is the GOAT out there. Yes. Now, Frankie Fiddler wears 23, loves LeBron James. Obviously, mm-hmm. the 23 Michigan State is up in the rafters because one Draymond Green wore that jersey. Now, he says, Frankie Fiddler, that is, says that he wants to have a conversation with Draymond Green to see if he could wear 23 for this upcoming season. How do you think that conversation is going to go, JT? I can't imagine one day, day. Uh, we'll green light this. I don't know. <laughs> I would think he would tell him, Hey, if you get 20 rebounds against Michigan this year, I'll yeah. let you wear it for a week. Yeah, and, uh, that's that's a end. good deal. That's a really good uh, <laughs> yo. I has there ever, I, I'm sure it has happened where like a player has changed their number for a week, but that's what it should be. Yeah, like yeah. honorary Draymond award. Like you, you, you rip 20 boards against yeah. Michigan, you get 23 for a week. Kid. Yeah, yeah, I like it, that it's a lot. enough that like your family members and friends and fans can buy like the jersey that has like Fiddler 23 on it. But like yeah. not enough that that's going to be what's going to be on his like Wikipedia or year end roster or anything. Yeah. So I think that would be that would be the perfect perfect <sighs> opportunity. More humbling moment for Frankie Filler the first time he blows a defensive assignment uh, with Tom Izzo coaching him, or that phone call where he's asking Draymond Green, "Hey, Day Day, just transferred to MSU. Can I have your number?" Like I, I think I, I think the answer is the Draymond. <laughs> I, I think I think Izzo's mellowed out a good amount, and I think okay. Draymond's. Kind of going the other direction, so yeah. that that's what I would answer out of those too. <laughs> Every player in MSU needs that moment, though. You know, just yes. the, uh, the the Draymond humble yeah. pie he might serve him. But uh, yeah. good luck to Frankie Fiddler. Who knows? Yes. Maybe catch Draymond on a good day. I don't know. Yep. Maybe he's on vacation in Cancun right now. Doesn't have to worry about the NBA playoffs. Yep. So catch him a few margaritas deep in Cancun right yes. now. That's that's yes. your best shot. Maybe. <laughs> I don't <Yeah>. know. <laughs> With that, I think that covers everything that we wanted to discuss in this week's episode. I hope so. I think um, it'll be a busy few weeks, though, with the portal open. Uh, All of the visits and offers and things of that nature, um, I'm sure we'll have on both of our our sites. And uh, we will continue to be talking about it on this show in future weeks. Also, I'm sure you'll be talking about them on Locked On Spartans um, on a daily basis. So, you know, it'll be uh, it'll be fun to cover that. Um, hopefully they don't have any more losses that would fit in that bucket of Barrow and Harmon. Um, 
there's anybody that fit in the other bucket, uh, I don't think you'll be hearing me changing my tune on um, on whether that's good or bad. And um, we'll see kind of what they go ahead and do from here. But I like the way they're operating in terms of who they're targeting, when they're targeting um, uh, things of that nature. So uh, with that, appreciate everybody tuning in. And uh, on behalf of Matt and myself, thank you for joining. And we will see you next week.